Welcome to Founder Stories here, Chicago Founders TV at 1871, where we interview great Chicago founders and hear their stories. We have a great founder with us tonight, David Kalt, who's the founder of uh, Reverb and the co-founder of Options Express. Welcome, David. Great Thanks, to Pat. Have you. Great Glad to be here. Um, so, a lot of people, uh, people who are you know hipping into the music scene, may know a little bit about Reverb. Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of people who are uh, active in the securities world might know Options Express, but for those who haven't, aren't familiar, can you just tell a little bit about sort of the comp each of the companies, so a little context to start it off? Sure. I'll start with Options Express. I, um, there's three, three passions in my life. One is music, guitars, uh, code, like programming, love software and programming, and three is finance. So I didn't leave the world of finance. Like I loved the world of finance and options trading. And um, we built an online brokerage starting in 2000 called Options Express. And the goal of Options Express was really to compete with the larger online brokers like Charles Schwab, Ameritrade, and E-Trade, and build a better retail investing platform for individuals that wanted to use options, just like hedge funds and professionals, but wanted to do it to manage their portfolio. And no one was really doing that at the time very well. We focused on that. We built, um, we, we lo raised a very little, little amount of money in Chicago, around two million bucks. And we were profitable within 18 months, took it public in 2005, and it ultimately was sold to Charles Schwab in 2010. And there's our founder story. Thanks for coming tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm like, I'm done with finance. I want to do something completely different, get back to my roots. Um, out of college, I was a recording engineer. I really wanted to uh, be in the music industry. So I bought a guitar store. And I bought a guitar store, a really a fairly infamous guitar store in Chicago called Chicago Music Exchange. From that experience, I went, I worked the store every day, learned the business, and um, started to grow that business. And that business is growing very, very quickly. But while doing that, I stumbled upon a really unique opportunity, which is buying and selling musical gear, um, guitars, drums, keyboards, DJ equipment. And it was all being done on eBay, and it was, it was a really bad experience. Through that experience, that pain, I uh, was inspired to launch Reverb, and uh, we started building it in 2012, launched it in January of 2013, and uh, it's growing very, very quickly. Great. Did I answer the question? Yeah, camera's on the right. Um, so the, uh, no, it's, so it's a great outcome. Options Express was one of the first billion dollar outcomes in Chicago. Um, Reverb, you know, I think I first, uh, we first, I got to first know a little bit about you uh, with Reverb when you uh, bought Chicago Music Exchange and everybody thought you were going off uh, to just chill out and <laughs> play drums or something, play guitar. Uh, I don't think people fully appreciated what you're up to and it's an interesting story how both, both were created. So talk a little bit, where'd you grow up, where are you from? Um, you know, talk about a little like, what was David called as a kid? <laughs> oh, um, from Detroit area from the suburbs of Detroit, uh, big, big Michigan kid, and uh, the youngest of three boys, so um, I figured out at an early age how to get attention, and, uh, and once I figured out how to get attention, I kind of wanted to be the center of attention. Uh, I was pretty nerdy, um, but I hung out with the popular kids, sort of, um, even though I couldn't do, I wasn't very good at sports, and I wasn't very athletic, but I liked to hang out with um, the cool kids, but I wasn't very cool. And, um, but when I was around 13 or 14, I like, I mean, when I, when I got that Tom Petty, Damn the Torpedoes album, like, that was it for me. I knew I was gonna do something in music and I was just totally inspired. So I, um, I was just like obsessing with music and I picked up the guitar when I was like 16 or 17 and that kind of influenced um, my teen years. So you're in music, any, um, any business or entrepreneurial things, you, your family, anything that because you've been an entrepreneur now for most of your adult life. Yeah. You know, as a kid, I grew up um, in a very entrepreneurial family. My family, uh, my grandmother started a travel agency out uh, in Royal Oak, Michigan. My father worked in it, my mother worked in it, my aunts worked in it. So at a very early age, I was like ingrained with family business culture, like payroll, how we, you know, like real nuts and bolts of, of how to run a business. And, and my weekends and summers were often involved in helping out with filing and I worked on the computer systems at an early age. So I was definitely um, um, part of a family business at a very early, early age. I also liked caddying. 
that was one of the best jobs I ever had as a teenager. I mean, getting out there and, and being in control of your destiny. I really liked the idea. I also parked valet cars. I loved the idea of, of having a gig where I was kind of in control of the schedule and the timing, but you also had, it was a service industry, right? I mean, if you're a caddy, you really have to learn how to accommodate, right? So I learned a lot from those, those types of experiences. Great, great. So you go to University of Michigan. What do you study? How do you, spend your, how do you spend your time? Political science, I'm definitely obsessing about music and a career in music, wanted to be a record producer and, and go that whole route and, and, and work the studio angle. But I'm a poli-sci major and I am extremely anti-establishment to the point where I was like hanging out with the Communist Party. Yeah, so if um, I knew you back then and I'd be, I haven't seen you since, um, what would I, how would I describe what you were like back then? If you were in Ann Arbor and there's the Diag and there was, you know, uh, a shanty for protesting apartheid, that's probably where I spent most of my afternoons. If there was a protest or something to a rally, something to get behind, I was, I was pretty much there. I, I, I looked at college as a totally um, experiential. I was, I was very um, questioning. I think it leads back to my youth, once again, curiosity. And that, it's that same curiosity that I think you need as a, as a rebellious entrepreneur. So there was a lot of rebellion in my youth. Um, but I still, I went to classes, I studied, I, w I always worked, you know, I didn't, I didn't take that for granted, but I still had a very, I think the music I listened to, it had a very anti-establishment um, um, theme. Like what, what were your big bands back then? The Clash, Tom Petty, very defiant, very rebellious. What about, uh, now you said, Communists. Is that hyperbole, or were you no. really hanging out with the communists? Yeah. I, 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 my first class was uh, called La Belle Epoque. It was a freshman seminar taught by a communist in Ann Arbor. And I read the Karl Marx, Marx Manifesto, and then I was like curious, like capitalism, like we just assume it. I really believe that if you want to embrace, and I am like the most laissez-faire, free market libertarian you will ever meet. But if you want to appreciate capitalism and you want to appreciate the system, you better go and study the alternatives and look at it and have a total grasp of it. And that's how I looked at it is, is like, I'm curious. I, you know, that curiosity kind of wavered after, after a little bit, but I was not going to just assume that our system uh, was the best because someone told me that. So you're pretty political in your college years then? Yeah. So yeah. you're... You're hanging out. You're pretty political. That you know, I, I remember those those years. We had a, at Georgetown. We had the um, shanty town, apartheid shanty town on the peace, and then of course South Africa um, became liberated. But those poor people in the '90s didn't have the same kind of big causes to rally behind <laughs> as, as we did. The uh, but you're looking at as you look at um, yourself leaving college. You know, you, professional communist. <laughs> not in the cards. So what do you? No, music. I was I was going to be a recording engineer, and uh, the you know in life you always have mentors. You always have to have someone that you're modeling uh, off of. And and for me it was it was Quincy Jones or Jimmy Ivan at the time. Jimmy Ivan had produced Bruce Springsteen, Tom Petty, and and um, Brian Eno. So I wanted to go in the studio and produce bands. That's what I wanted to do. And I realized I did that for around a year and a half, and I realized that is a profession where it's not about the one-tenth of one percent. It's about the like one one-ten-thousandth of a percent of people that can even make a reasonable living doing it. And I realized that after falling in love with my wife, I realized I, I made a very rational decision that um, I did not want to be doing that when I was 30 or 35 because I wasn't that good. I was not going to really be able to elevate to the level I wanted to. So um, and you're out in LA doing this? I did a little bit in LA and then in Chicago as well. Um, so you're out in LA, you're doing the record thing. Is it? Is there a point where it's like, this is it, and then a point that this isn't it, or was it, was it pretty clear right it's away? It's $3.35 an hour for 75 hours a week. In the day, I was doing jingles. In the night, I was doing house music and rap music, and then a heavy metal band would come in, and I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't function. Um, and the people that do that, I mean, they have a real talent, <laughs> real sort of resilience to, to that skill set. It just wasn't for me, and I knew it, and I and I was not gonna I was not gonna press it. So, 
so this is not the most typical founder story so far. <laughs> you know, we don't hear about being a communist very often. Um, we usually hear a little more, thank you, entrepreneurial things, and we hear a little more about technology. Most people are like, they're competing to be like, am I the youngest person to have, you know, right. had my own computer or been, been coding? My youngest one so far is seven, and uh, he was coding. Brett Hurt, my last one, who did uh, uh, Bizarre Voice 70, coded 40 hours a week. So you're at the other end here. I've heard no coding in your story, and we're 23. Yeah. So, but this a change happens after you decide to leave the music business. Talk a little bit about that inflection point in your life. You know, I um, so I knew I was I knew that I couldn't go halfway into this business. I I was not going to um, survive. So I had a hundred percent dive into something else. So I I started to teach myself to code. But the cool thing is, I really do believe that there are a lot of people that start very early. I mean, the, the the kids that I'm hiring now have been doing, have been writing code for a while. But I, with all these boot camps, I've seen some incredible mid-career, mid-20s kids really turn it around. And I, I went at it with that same passion that I saw what was happening in the digital world. So what year, what year was that? What year, so is your- 1991, 92. Okay, so that's really early for coding though. I mean, Internet is not only not mainstream, it's not really even known outside of academic circles. DOS, Windows, right, yeah. Right, so what, um, as, you, as you look at what um, that choice, that was a popular choice in 2001, not in 91. What, what is it that made you see that at that stage? Mm -hmm. Well, in the studio world, it was, it was becoming very digitized. So everything um, that we... Um, that we were working on the recording studio, it was like going from analog to digital. So I started tinkering with computers while working in the recording studio, realizing that, that I wanted to elevate myself as a, as a software developer would take a total transition. But that's where I kind of got introduced to it. And then it was self-taught, and I started taking classes at DePaul. I ended up getting a master's at DePaul here in oh, Chicago wow. really? in the evening while working in various... And what was it in exactly? It was in computer science, master's That's in cool. computer science. And what kind of languages were you working with back in the early days? There was a lot of Unix back then, C, C++. Um, and then, you know, I would use like uh, Borland, DBase. These are all, you know, like <laughs> um, Pascal, you know. Yeah. So. So, so you make the legit move into technology. It's a real right. pivot yeah. um, professionally. And uh, you're doing this at a time that, where it's not yet cool. We're way before eBay and all these sorts of things and the consumer internet and the dot-com uh, boom. Uh, so talk about how you took sort of uh, being a, way ahead of the curve in terms of this being uh, the, the force it's become over the last 20 years or so. Um, talk about what you did to sort of be really ready to you know, in the early days to sort of figure out how to make a career, and, and you did some entrepreneurial things here. Mm -hmm. So I, I, w I went back to the skills that I, that I had growing up in, in the travel business. So I knew I wanted to marry technology with travel. My family owned this travel agency. I knew the business pretty well. So I got a gig in Chicago, um, a couple of gigs, one at Arrington Travel in the 90s, another one at the Signature Group. And I was working in their technology, uh, their IT departments, while I was. So, so let me just ask you a question about that. So, had you not been a family, not been in the travel business, would you probably not have found that? I wouldn't. I, I felt I had some some sort of inherent expertise right. um, in that industry that I could talk the language, that I um, had a certain jargon, and it made it easier for me to think about. Um, um, the business because it was something I knew, right? I think we gravitate to things that we know, things that, that we have some Well, we find that a lot. We talk a lot about founder market fit here on Founder Stories, and one of the things I think that's important about founder market fit is w the founders have to have in that initial team DNA inside-out understanding, yeah. either inerrant in what they did before or something that which we call kind of um, uh, earned or yeah. learned where they went out and did it, yeah. right? Um, and you very rarely see a business where people haven't done it. And the only exception I've seen in founder stories are people who ended up doing consulting projects for a period of time, mm -hmm. building things for an industry, mm -hmm. and that's how they, they learned it. So we see that as a very common trend. Mm -hmm. So what kind of leg up did that give you? Like what did that enable you to do that um, let that business kind of get some get, take flight? Well, while I was working uh, and learning the business from you know, established uh, players, 
I then um, would see opportunities. I'm the, I'm the guy who's tinkering, getting my hands, rolling up my sleeves, getting in there and seeing where the, where the pain points are. So I started to develop an app, a, a software program for um, my family's agency while I was working in Chicago and other, other companies called ClientBase. And when I started to show it to people outside of my family's agency which started using it, it got some real traction. And I was able to leverage that to basically vet, find a, um, um, a large consortium like American Express Travel, Carlson Travel, these were big organizations at the time. I was able to leverage that to get someone to basically pre-buy my software, which would be the equivalent of doing your seed round today. I just got a vendor to basically seed my business so that he bought $20,000 worth of software. Now I could leave my, my full-time employment launch my business. That's really cool. That's a, it's a great funding strategy too, yeah. if you can do it. It's funny, one of the other things we talk about is, you know, we, we all think of, sa of companies as, you know, sort of running big negative uh, cash flow and burning cash, but all the SaaS businesses, the, the software as a service businesses, if you look at the ones that have been successful, they've been very revenue first driven, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, rather than VC funding, you know, big cash burn up front. Mm -hmm. They may burn when they grow, um, sometimes successfully, sometimes not as successfully, mm -hmm. but almost all the really big companies in, in town that have done this were revenue first companies. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that that was a, a, a real lesson mm -hmm. for you. Definitely. Um, so talk a little bit about, uh, you know, you, you, you're doing that, you grow, like what does it grow into and sort of how does that play out? So um, client-based software was, was the only um, platform at the time that was like a CRM system. So it was a CRM system for the travel industry. We had thousands of users, they were paying us an annual license fee, and um, I had around 25 employees. Um, it was, you know, I just figured it out on my own. I didn't really have a partner, uh, bootstrapped it, and to the point where I was causing real pain to this accounting software platform called Trams, because he wanted to build a similar platform. I beat him to it. I was taking all the market share from him, and one day he just, he just met me at a conference, and he's like, I just, I need you to come work with me. And I was 28 years old and it was seven figures. It sounded like a lot of money. I was kind of, I don't know, maybe getting bored with this. This, this is kind of the family travel industry and I was like wanting to go do something else. So I what, sort of- What year is this? This is 97, 98. So the world's starting to heat up a lot too. So as a, te as a tech entrepreneur, yeah. Well, I saw my customers, actually, the biggest decision, I saw my customers completely going away, including my family's business, which today is worth practically nothing. Um, and I said, the people that are buying my software are probably not going to be in business in three years, maybe 10 years. I started writing software like Expedia, Travelocity, Kayak today, like those kind of travel um, price line. And I realized it was gonna take a lot of capital to really build a good travel booking engine. This is 1995, 96. Wow. So, I mean, the internet, you know, Netscape is still like the dominant browser. And when I had that offer to sell the business versus take everything I had and go out and raise money to try and compete with, Expedia was originally funded by Microsoft. Right. Microsoft was now gonna be in my business. And I was like, I don't know. I think there's something else I could do with a few million <laughs> bucks that would maybe have a better return. So, so that kind of drove my decision. Uh, great. So it's 97? 97, 98. And so great success. You know, you've got some money. What do you do? I start trading options, shorting internet stocks. <laughs> Real smart. I lost around a million bucks in around three months. Wow. So I made it. I lost it. Well, that's the that's the old joke sure. about that's the old joke about um, you can be right about a trend, but if you're too early, it's yeah. the same as being wrong. <laughs> right. um, so, yeah, I'm, I think all the shorts were probably burned out by the time they the, the, the bubble but finally burst. That was a really that was a that was a good learning experience, and that made me really want to understand the options business in a way that that um, I was able to go build Options so, Express. So how did Options Express come about? Talk a little bit about the genesis and, and you met your founders, Ned, and your co-founders, Ned and Jim. So um, going through this experience, so now I'm like uh, a, free, a free man. I sold my business. I am like, you know, trading uh, in a Charles Schwab account and basically gambling. Um, 
anyone that tells you, you know, trade, in, in, and I ran a brokerage firm, completely regulated guy, but you know, it's entertainment, it's, it's, it's gambling in a lot of ways. Um, I lost a lot of money and I realized I loved, I still loved it. I loved options trading. I loved what, um, I loved the opportunity and I felt that the products that were out there, the Charles Schwab's, the E-Trades, the Ameritrade's were just an underserved market. So, and talk a little bit about that, because I think some people weren't around, they were pretty young then, or, or others may not have been as involved. So on, on the surface of it, if you were just a, doing a generic analysis, you would look at those businesses and say, you're going to get some big guys, right? Mm -hmm. There's Charles Schwab's going online. There's this whole group of people who, uh, Ameritrade, there's all these players going in with a lot of capital into the consumer um, retail, 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 trading. Yeah. retail trading business. Um, so at, at first blush to the uninitiated, that didn't look like a good market. It looked even more crowded than travel. Yeah. You obviously identified a need. Talk about how you identified that need because everyone else would have looked and said, you got all these Goliaths and it's strategic to them. Yeah. So what was the opportunity and how did you see that? Well, one, the, the makeup of the partnership. So there were, there were three of us. I, um, I met Jim Gray, who was a professional options trading. He, his family had a, a company called G-Bar, and they were a professional options mar market maker. And then he introduced me to my um, real mentor, Ned Bennett. Ned Bennett had been in the brokerage business for 30-some years. He's probably 20 years my senior. And he really taught me the brokerage business. I mean, take the Series 7, the 63, I, I became a registered broker. I was the tech guy, but I was also the CEO and the, and the front man of the company. So um, Ned knew that there was, from his prior experience, that there was an underserved market in terms of retail options investors that were at these other firms, very profitable customers, very um, um, good customers, the same experience that I had, he sort of knew it from the professional side. So we compared notes, Jimmy knew it from the professional side, and we came together and we said, we're gonna build um, a, a, an online trading experience to serve this niche. Um, the cool thing was, it was a niche. I mean, it clearly in 2000 was a niche. There weren't like tons of options traders but so, so, talk, so talk about, though, because in theory, people would say these big companies are out there in the retail uh, secure, securities business, and they do options. That's one of their right. options. So why did you all see that as an opportunity instead of a barrier? Through my experience as a customer, I felt a lot of pain. I couldn't do the things that I needed to do. I lost a lot of money, really, because the product was in, in, inefficient. It was expensive. The pricing was not accurate. The service wasn't good. The flexibility so of the platform. So why was that? I mean, these are big players well, that obviously were good at something else. Yeah. I think, that, I, think I did choose. We choose a, cho chose a more complex securities product, the options product. It's not for everyone. It's definitely a little bit more advanced. But the demand for people that wanted to learn that was very great. The, the brokers at the time just weren't committing the resources to it. There's really no explanation other than if you looked at the market at the time, you would say, oh, 3 million contracts traded a day. It's a nice, a nice business. And that's so how So were they kind of checking the box, like we have to have yeah. that functionality, but we're not going to be great at that exactly. market? Exactly. And... We didn't only look at it that we wanted to be great at that market, we wanted to grow that market, right? Mm. I mean, if you look at Uber today, Uber is like four or five times the taxi market in San Francisco, right? The investors, I was talking to one of the early Uber investors, he didn't make a bet that Uber was going to actually uh, surplant, you know, overcome what ta the taxi market, the, the size of the taxi market in San Francisco or any other city. But we did the similar thing with options trading. We realized that we could actually teach people. We believed in the product, hmm. and we believed in our platform that we believed not only could we get, and today the options market trades 20 million contracts a day or 25 million contracts a day, and we helped ride that wave. We helped grow that market. Do you think that concept of focusing on a niche that the other people aren't on that's attractive is a viable way in other markets potentially to go after where big guys are? in the neighborhood, yeah. or do you think that yours was unique? I think there's lots of examples of that, and to be honest, that's my only like real world experience. So I'm not the guy who's gonna, and I've invested in a lot of businesses, and 
I'm not the guy who's looking to do something radically different. Like to me, disruption is taking someone's existing business model, doing it better, focusing on some subset or some niche, niche of that, better pricing, better service, better platform. That's kind of how I look at the world, and I love businesses that disrupt within the, those constraints. Um, that's what we're doing at Reverb, um, and that's what we did at Options Express. Great. Well, let's, let's talk a little about the early Options Express, because you know, the challenge in all businesses you know, was uh, how do you get customers, right? And this is early internet. So talk a little bit about how you all dealt with the, you, you said earlier that you were profitable in 18 months. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you'd have a lot of customers to do that. So. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that early experience. What did you do? How did you acquire customers? What were the insights that you had? How did you get there? Was it you know, lucky, serendipitous, strategic? How did you guys figure it out? Yeah. So remember, it's 2001, no social media, um, very limited email capability. You, you would rent email lists or buy emails at the time, but there wasn't really good targeted email lists of the customers we were going after. So we did what we called channel partnerships back then. We partnered with other people who we thought had customers that, would, that, were, that were likely to be option traders. So these were educational firms. These were firms that did seminars teaching people how to trade options. These are people who um, went to various seminars and we, would, we built a product called auto trading. So if you went to one of these seminars or you subscribed to one of these newsletters, we built a service specifically to help you auto trade that service. It's very unique specialized niche, and that got us all we wanted. We, I mean, I'm, I am like a laser-focused entrepreneur. If you tell me what, what, what goals I need for 2016, I will tell you like within you know, a hundredth. I knew that I needed 5,000 customers in 2002, and all we needed to do was get to 5,000 customers, and we modeled it out, we would be cash flow positive. So this is the fastest path to get to 5,000 customers. We focused on these partnerships. We, we, how'd you get? How'd you figure out the right newsletters, and how'd you get the deals done? You know, we um, we pressed the flesh. We did what we could do in terms of um, um, co-marketing and affiliate relationships at the time. It's a very regulated industry, so you can't you can't actively pay. We also built a great product, and we thought that we knew that these newsletter writers would um, would want to recommend our platform because it was so specialized and because this auto trading service actually was complementary to their business. So it was a very synergistic relationship and it was really our ability to, uh, to self-fund. It's like, it's like me selling my software in the first business. I was able to get these partners to basically get me over that hump of, of, of establishing uh, Options Express as a real business. So talk a little bit about, um, if three of you partners uh, who found the business. You were CEO, but you all had significant, this wasn't, I didn't get, the, I don't get the sense like these are partners you could have just fired on day two. No. <laughs> so. It's just the opposite, yeah. Um, so we, how did you guys make that, how did you all make that work? Um, it was a good, it was a good dynamic. I and mean, we had our moments, um, you know, very strong, opinionated um, entrepreneurs, all three of us, and um, coming from a different vantage point. And, uh, but that made, that tension created really, really good outcome. Um, I like, you know, I was very, Jim would challenge me, I would challenge Jim, Ned so, would mention So what did, me. what did each of you bring and how did they complement versus overlap? So Jim, Jim had a lot of industry um, uh, relationships um, on the professional side, on the market making side with the exchanges and things of like that. Ned really knew the brokerage business. He was understood the regulatory, regulatory aspects of the business understood uh, the customer, and really understood operations. I was the tech guy and, uh, and the CEO, but I was really focused on building the platform. And I, I think a lot of our, I mean, what I'm, one of the things I'm most proud of with Options Express, 18 months profitability, 24 months, 64 pre-tax margins, one of the most profitable online brokerages ever built, and uh, went public within four years. We did that because we, we really understood um, the technology and, and the tech advantage. But the three of us, I mean, I couldn't have done that without Ned and his brokerage experience. Jimmy really connected us with the industry and, and, and those three things were, you know, really um, established us early, early on. So talk a little bit, if you would, about the market you ended up going after. Because a lot of us, you know, either people don't think deeply enough about who their customer, what segment they're going to go after. I mean, we were laughing with Desiree earlier, someone who said, my market is everyone who has a mobile phone. Well, that's not obviously not a market. 
Um, and so I think that there's, a, uh, there's an element of this which is um, very interesting. A lot of people talk about these things. You had a competitor here in Chicago, very successful company, Thinkorswim. Um, but they, you each targeted different market segments. Mm -hmm. Talk, before you explain the benefit, the ups and downs of it, talk a little bit, if you would, about um, who they targeted and who you targeted, and then we can get into the relative right. merits. So remember, it's, it's 2002, 2003, so there's still an adoption with putting your money in a brokerage and actually going and being what we call a self-directed investor. Clicking the button, I want to buy 1,000 shares of Microsoft. I want to trade. So we realized, and how you build that platform, just like in today, it's like where the generation gaps are influence how you build your platform. So we were building our platform to target an older audience, more experienced, more money, more discretionary income, more likely to be trading options. Our customers were actually people who had made money, like, like myself. They had money and time to actually- What was the age range like, typically? Typically 35 to 55 was sort of our sweet spot. So not early adopters of technology, though. Not exactly. So did you ever think twice about this and say, should we be going for 25-year-olds? If we wanted to build a sexy business and raise a lot of money and impress um, uh, venture investors that we were going after the next generation, that might have been, that might have been the right approach. Um, we felt that the opportunity to build a, a real business, a profitable business, lied in this other customer base that may have not been as obvious to uh, And you, you all had a higher um, valuation and ended up with a bigger outcome, although Thinkorswim was also very successful. Talk for just a minute about um, you know, how you, clearly yours was a better market in terms of lifetime value of those customers. They were also successful, but not to the same degree. Um, but you had a challenge, which is, this is in 2016, you can argue going after a broader demographic group. Right. But in 2001, 2, 3, that wasn't necessarily, um, not only was it not conventional wisdom, it wasn't easy. Right. Um, what is it that you think allowed you all to overcome that and, and what made the, the reality more achievable than it might have seemed to an outsider in terms of driving adoption of new technology for this particular group? Mm -hmm. So we spent a lot of time, um, and I, I do this today at Reverb. I mean, I really, you know, the, the, the playbook is the same as, you can build a great platform, and we built lots of tools and lots of, you know, we tried to make it really easy to use, but you have to support it with great customer service, great education, great onboarding techniques. So what that, what'd that look like? Like, talk to us about how would your onboarding have been different, and what was your customer, what, what were the They didn't even use the word onboarding back then. <laughs> um, it was, well, one, live chat, like today chat is, ubiquitous with, with most e-commerce platforms. In 2002, we adopted live chat and we, um, we made it, staffed it 12 to 13 hours a day. Um, you know, we guaranteed like a three to four hour email response because Ned and I were in the email chain every day. I mean, you know, the other, one of my investors in, um, in Reverb is Eric Rees, the, 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 the gentleman who wrote The Lean Startup. And we really lived that, that lean startup at Options Express before it was in vogue. And the way you, the, 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 what I get out of a lean startup is the entrepreneurs are so entrenched in the business that they really understand that dynamic. So for me, with Options Express, we really were listening to the customers in real time and we were hearing what they wanted and we were building the platform and providing the service that really hit the, hit the, hit the right chord for our customers and that's, how, that's your cheapest form of marketing, right? If you really do that right, your customers will help you grow your business. So talk about your growth, the growth of the business. You got your 5,000 customers, you get break even, then what? What are the next then, then we have some marketing money because we're actually in control of our destination. We raised two million bucks locally, mostly friends and family, um, 50,000, $100,000 investors. And, um, but once we were cash flow positive, we then were obviously gonna see- I wish I knew you guys then. For sure, I liked. I love Jim. You're a great guy, but I didn't know you back then. Unfortunately, I heard those investors did pretty well. What was the? Was it like 150 x? Yeah, yeah. So like a fifty thousand dollar investment. Well, my father, like I said, my my family's traveling. She's worth nothing. Their their life is supported by their fifty thousand dollar investment in Options Express, which is like a seven or ten million dollar um, winner when it went public. Um, 
So that was good. <laughs> <laughs> Made back for some of my losses trading options too. Um, and, and by the way, who would think that not going in the family business would end up helping you save the family <laughs> right. finan business yeah. value, right? That's great. <laughs> well, um, I heard Jim's, Jim's dad said, you know, with all the money they did and all the things they did, they, Options Express was the biggest winner. It was such mm -hmm. a great, great success. So, you know, it's kind of the legend in town, um, the success. What other money did you raise along the way? So we raised two million bucks and we then, we were able, then as we got profitable, we really started to spend more on marketing. And that's how we went from 10,000 customers to half a million customers over the next four to five years. We realized it was gonna be, it could be a real retail brand and we would buy television ads on CNBC and, and all the, the typical things that you did as a large online broker. Before we went public in 2004, at the time, like any prudent entrepreneur, we were, you know, hey, are we gonna go public? Um, what are the markets gonna be like? Will we continue this growth? There's no, right, there's no guarantees. I mean, back to my sort of communist manifesto, like <laughs> I have a, only the, Andy Grove, only the paranoid survive. And we were always paranoid that, that the success that we had wasn't guaranteed in the future. So in 2004, we did, um, we did a private equity round with Summit Partners and we sold them a third of the company um, for like 90 million bucks uh, at the time. And the comp that, so that would have valued the company at 300 and then we went public at a little over a billion 12 months later. How was it going public back then? It was good, it's 2004, you know, Google went public, and people don't realize it, in 2004. And Google's only been a public company for 12 years. So Google went public in 04. We went in like August of 04. We went in January of 05. Um, and you know, every day you're on the phone with Goldman Sachs. How's the market? You know, what's it going to be? And then the road. And show. you tell them I'm a former commie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the anti-banker. Uh, no. I now just, you're paying the bankers. I just smiled and negotiated. Tens of millions of dollars. Negotiated the fee, right? <laughs> Um, so you you go public. How'd you like being CEO of a public company? You know, I didn't love that. I didn't love that. I mean, clearly my um, my passions lie in in building in the early stages of a company. I love the um, the creative aspects of building, and now running a public company, um, the the conversations change. It's about the quarter. It's about what are you going to do next? How are you going to change? You know, what's this opportunity? And you sit with really, really smart Harvard MBAs who think they know your business better than you. And <laughs> after a while, it gets, it gets actually a little, um, it can wear you down to the point where you start making decisions that, 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 that impact um, the culture of the business, that impact the strategy of the business. Um, the business is all about M&A, and it, either you're gonna be acquired or you're gonna acquire. And um, I just wasn't, I don't think I was best suited for that. Um, and um, we had a great CFO and it was, uh, it, it, because we had good succession, we had good re retention, I had good partners, it was easy for me to gracefully um, accept. So your business. CFO, David Fisher, who joined you from Potbelly, then yeah. became the CEO. Correct. And now he's CEO of Innova, mm -hmm. uh, which is now public. So he must like this public company CEO thing. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> seems David's good at that. He helped us go public and He's got, he's got those well. skills. Um, so talk a little bit about um, the sabbatical. Yeah. So um, my partner, Ned, calls it on the beach, right? Um, and I said that to someone once, and they're like, where'd you go? I'm like, no, no, it's just a phrase. <laughs> We're on the beach. Um, in between gigs, um, uh, this idea that I knew I wanted to do something. I was, I, I, my identity was associated with the financial markets. I actually, you know, would wear a suit quite often, um, but I didn't feel that that was my destiny. I didn't feel, I didn't want to define myself as an options guy or an options tech guy. I was really um, I felt that I had something completely different uh, um, in me, similar to how when I left the travel tech business. So um, it was time to kind of revisit, um, revisit the music industry. And I thought a lot about different ways to do it. I could get in the studio and the production business. But what I loved about, what I loved about Options Express, I love trading. I love buying and selling things. I love transactions. I love tech. And I love music. So I thought that a store and, and the retail aspects of the business of, of, of being in commerce was more suited to my liking. And, and I had the 
you know, I had the capital to, to really invest in. in so you buy a store up by my house, Chicago yeah. Music Exchange, which is a legendary store in the music business. Tell people a little bit about the, the why it's a legendary store. Sure. So I, um, well, first I actually tried to launch this business without buying a store. I, I called up Fender and Gibson and I said, I want to um, start selling your products online. And they said, you have to own a brick and mortar store. So it became evident that um, owning a store was part of the strategy. So then I approached the owner of Chicago Music Exchange, a great, well, well-known shop in, in Chicago. Every Let's, time I drive by, I picture Ray Charles. <laughs> exactly. Brothers. That's what it, the Ray's Music Exchange, that's kind of where he, where Scott got the name from. So I approached the owner. I had bought, when, I, when we did that round with Summit Partners in 2004, the first thing I did, my partners bought fancy cars. I went and bought a 1963 Strat, hence my Twitter, Twitter tag, 63 Strat. So that was really, and I bought it from Chicago Music Exchange. So I, so I experienced the store early on. I was a customer. And the store's a little like a museum yeah. at the time, wasn't it? So if you're into, into old instruments and, uh, and you're a collector, whether you're Johnny Depp or Tom Petty or plenty of very, very successful bankers and lawyers um, really admire guitars just like people admire art. And there's a lot of history um, to collecting guitars. This store is the destination for those people. So we have a lot of Japanese customers, a lot of European customers and a lot of just rock stars and wealthy individuals. But I didn't want to build, I didn't want that business. I, I liked what he had built. He built an amazing museum, but I wanted to build it into a business, a real business. And, I, and so I worked on transforming it from a museum into a real iconic store where people can actually go and, and buy things. So you, you buy the thing and you go run it. Yeah. And so tell me, what do you learn by running a retail business? It's gotta be, it's not free, like it's got to be some serious work. <laughs> so similar to uh, trading options where you had to do it to, to experience it so I could build the product, I was in the business of basically buying and selling new and used guitars. I had a staff of around 10 people. I, had to work, I worked in the repair shop. I, I, I wanted to understand the business and really understand how I was going to grow this into uh, another business. I didn't completely have the ambitions that this was, I mean, Reverb's on pace to be a another multi-billion dollar business. I did not have those ambitions when I bought the store. I really did have the ambitions that I was gonna come and I was gonna build a, a successful business, but I was kinda, like you said, I was kinda thinking I was gonna do it in a, in a more you know, laid back, um, passive hobby type way. But clearly my personality did not, does not permit that, so. So you're doing it, and when, at what point do you start moving towards the, uh, towards the reverb model? Like what's, what are the steps from retail to, you know, now you've raised a lot of money. So like what, talk about that transition, that, that, that transition. So we're running this retail store and it's growing and we start developing content. We start a video channel, it becomes very successful. We have this one video called um, 100 Riffs. Uh, it goes viral at uh, Chicago Music Exchange. And then, so I, I got a taste of a little bit of technology at Chicago Music Exchange. The e-commerce site is doing really well. So the business will do around $40 million this year. It was growing at like 200% a year since, since we bought it. And um, along the way, similar to my options trading experience, I started buying and selling guitars on eBay. And eBay is the, is the Goliath in this industry. Um, they do around a billion dollars of musical instruments. Um, and it was a really painful experience. Um, Were not, you selling things personally or no, for, the for the store? Off the store. I was store. using the store. And I was listening to other people that were having similar awful experiences on eBay. And at the time, I um, took a look over at, um, at Etsy. I was very inspired by Etsy, which is an incredible marketplace for right. um, crafts and So jewelry. what did, did eBay, I mean, the, you know, a lot of people have said this about eBay over time. And the trick with eBay is that they have liquidity. So what was their liquidity like? Because most people will say, well, eBay is not perfect for this, but that's where the buyers are. Yeah. So, you know, do they have good liquidity? Well, eBay has, yeah, massive selection, right? So um, people go to eBay because if you post your instrument, your, your, whether it's a guitar or a car, right, you're going to get buyers, right? And that's, that's what eBay is really, really good at. The problem with... So how do you overcome that, though? Because often in marketplaces, people will say, well, they're not very good, but... It's like Amazon tried to take on eBay. Right. eBay had all the sellers, the buyers were there because of the sellers. 
Um, what, how, how, when you think about a two-sided marketplace, um, the, the challenge is a lot of people think customer experience, but a lot of better customer experiences have died along the wayside um, because people were you know, unable to get, some other place had liquidity. The C plus experience with liquidity was beating the A experience without liquidity. Exactly. So how do you solve that problem? Yeah. Well, coming from the option space and the trading space, I knew that there was, there was a financial model here. There's a financial incentive. And the business, even on eBay, the, what I call the spread between what a seller would get for an instrument versus what it would cost for their next instrument was just too wide. There was too much money um, that was either in a dealer's hand or some person that was not the end user, the musician. And I saw that as an opportunity to compress that. Now, how I did that is when we launched Reverb. And what, uh, was, what was the range like? The range was, if I, when I bought Chicago Music Exchange, I would buy a guitar for $1,000, same guitar. I would try and sell it for $1,800, make 80 points on it, and sit and watch it for six months, and eventually sell it for $1,600. And a lot of my competitors were doing the exact same thing, and it was uh, an and awful how much, return on capital. And how much, and e, so you'd sell it at 1800 eBay would keep the 200 well, eBay would keep 10%, 180, 10%, 180, yeah, 180 yeah, bucks, yeah. Roughly 200. Yeah. If I sold it on eBay, if I sold it um, on my own website or on my store, it would a similar model, just less fees. Got it. So, so it's more the sellers. You saw the inefficiency for sellers. I saw the inefficiency for the musicians who, right. ironically, musicians are, are constantly um, obsessing about their next instrument. So they're never satisfied with, I have a guitar, that's it. No, it's... I have a guitar, this works great for this, but I need a Les Paul to do this, and I need a new pedal and an amp to accomplish this. So there's this constant. So are your sellers also your buyers? Yes. Ah. yes. So we, the benefit of our marketplace is when we acquire a buyer, there's around a 60 to 70% likelihood that they're actually going to be a seller on our platform. Interesting. Is that something you thought about going into this or just serendipitous? It's kind of serendipitous. I realized it um, because our customers were constantly trading with us. They would constantly be bringing stuff in. So I realized there was that component. I didn't realize it was going to be as big as it was. Well, you kind of get a two for one or a 1.6 or 1.7 for one when you acquire one side. So that's exactly. pretty powerful. It's very powerful. Yeah. It's very powerful. And it builds incredible loyalty. I looked at another example like Airbnb. If you're a host in Airbnb, you are more likely to use Airbnb Airbnb when you travel, right? So my sellers are really committed to the platform and they actually are, are, are exclusively buying on the platform as huh. well. And you can actually build a much better um, experience and, and loyalty in that regard as well. So how hard was it to build early liquidity? So since, how'd you do it? Like how'd you solve that problem? Since I owned the Chicago Music Exchange, I had this, this immediate customer of this platform, Reverb, right? So Reverb, Reverb is a marketplace. What, what year is it you started Reverb? Started Reverb, um, in, launched it in January of 13. Okay. Built it in fall of 2012. So talk about what, what happens in 13 and, and how, how you, you know, we talk about leaning each way to get buyers and sellers. Just talk, yeah. break that down a little bit. So launch the platform day one, right? So you're building a marketplace and you've got all this great tech and you're gonna market, you've, you understand um, SEO and how you're going to approach customers. But if you don't have product on your platform, you don't have a business, right? So the whole mission is to get inventory on the platform. So we launched it with really good inventory from this related company, Chicago Music Exchange. And that inventory was really the, the, um, the magnet that attracted other inventory. So you can't just like put it up there. You have to spend a lot of time, good photography, good descriptions, good experience. And then other people would say, wow, I can actually get prices similar to what Chicago Music Exchange gets if I list my inventory alongside there. Now all of a sudden that guitar that they would get $1,000 for, they're getting close to fourteen or $1,500 for it. So let me, let, me ask, let, me ask you, let me ask you a question. If you were gonna sell, if you had, you know, a small shop that didn't have the brand Chicago Music Exchange, would you have gotten the same numbers or did that brand really help? It helped and it hurt. So it helped in the sense that um, musicians uh, immediately saw the opportunity to sell on there, but other dealers looked at it as a competitive threat. Interesting. They would, why would I want to support Reverb when um, there's this relationship with Chicago Music Exchange? 
So I had to work, work extremely diligently to one, create a Chinese wall, completely separate businesses, different ownership or common ownership, but not 100% same ownership. I have outside investors in Reverb. Um, I've since left, I have a CEO at Chicago Music Exchange. I don't, I'm not involved in the day-to-day -day operations of that business. I work exclusively at Reverb. So, so making sure structurally that I could, that I could with good conscience, m tell customers that this, the, these are completely different businesses. To this date, Chicago Music Exchange has no advantage on the platform. They actually are disadvantaged in right. a lot of ways. But in the early days getting that, you saw that, um, you know, GMAC Ally did that. They yeah. created this online marketplace for all these cars that get off lease. And everybody, there were, you know, we saw venture, you saw more businesses that had this idea of we'll create an online marketplace, B2B marketplace. They own the cars. Yeah, right. They could put them on. Right. They really, they, that, you know, that seeding a marketplace yeah. goes a long way uh, because the chicken egg problem is a hard one. Mm -hmm. um, so it's an interesting approach. So talk about 2013, kind of what kind of growth do you get? 2014, like just give us, what, sure. what, what are you comfortable sharing? So we launched it, and oh, that's the other thing. I mean, I am the most transparent, overly transparent entrepreneur. You can ask me any question. I'll share just about any number with anyone. I, I feel that if you work, at Reverb, you should know the business inside out. If you're not aligned with my interests, you know, it's, you're probably not a good fit. So we are overly transparent, so, so bring it on. We started the business, um, seeded it with half a million bucks, launched it in 2013, and by the end of the year, we, were doing, we did around two million in GMV, gross merchandise value, value, which is like sales on the platform. We take six. We take around. We t our, our base fee is three and a half percent. Let's, let's. I want to come back to the fee in a sec because this is really interesting. Yeah. But, but but get the growth for a second, and then you've got an interesting fee model. I want to I want to take time on that alone too. So year one we do two million on the platform. Year two we do thirty five million on the platform. Year three we do which was twenty fifteen one hundred and ten. This year we'll do between two seventy and three hundred wow. on the platform. Fantastic. Fantastic. And at what point do you decide to take outside money? So um, I launched it, seeded it with my own capital, and then eight months later, I realized that this was a real business. People were paying the fees. They, they saw the strategy. It was growing at incredible pace month after month. And at that point, I was comfortable taking friends and family money. I was not interested in an institutional investor. I, I you know, I, I have that luxury because of, because of my prior experience. It wasn't going to be that challenging to raise money, but I was not going to raise money from friends and family without a high degree of confidence in success. And, um, and that was after nine months, so we did a $2 million round. I contributed in that round as well. And then um, and we did another round a year later, a uh, $4 million round with the same investors. And, uh, and then at some point you brought Summit back in. Your friends we brought Summit. Summit, Summit back in in uh, December of 2015. Um, they invested $25 million just six months ago, and, uh, and that, that really is the capital to fuel this business to potentially an IPO in 2018 or 2019. Wow. So this fee thing is very interesting because you've got, you've got interesting dynamics that I just want to triangulate to set it up for people who haven't necessarily seen it. So the, the first thing is most founders either have a low fee um, but don't charge enough money, there's no way to get up, or they have these ideas, but they never really figured out how to put them together, or they charge too much money and they don't drive the adoption mm -hmm. they need. Mm -hmm. You've got an interesting one because you're taking at least the sticker price fee, the, uh, the uh, seller fee, mm -hmm. um, and you're lowering it materially. Um, so you've got to figure out how do you take the fees down and what's your seller fee, your base seller fee? Our base fee is three and a half percent. Three and a half percent, okay. So you take it way down, but your your effective fee, your sort of, is around what, our seven? take rate. Our take rate is around six to seven percent. Six to seven percent. So talk about how you did both. Why why didn't you just ask for seven? Because um, if eBay's at ten, and then how did you really do what most people say they'll do but never do, which is to, yeah, we can make lots of money other ways. Right. Everybody says they're going to make money other ways. Few people do. <laughs> right. Right. Um, when you're trying to disrupt a, a large player, I mean, and we did at Options Express, we had a very competitive commissions in the beginning too. So I, I, eBay is averages around 10% commission in our category. Amazon charges 15 points. I wanted it to be a no brainer. I wanted to over deliver on the platform and the product and the service 
at a low fee. And the challenge then is to figure out how to, how to basically build a profitable business with a low fee structure. You have to have a lot of volume. You have to make it up in volume. So we, we modeled it at 3.5%, and we really felt that we could actually disrupt the market heavily there, and then figure out how to add additional services that were more in an a la carte mode. So one, um, PayPal is, is pretty um, widely used in musical instruments buying and selling. So we built a competitor to that, we call it Direct Checkout, which allows us to take the credit card, pay the seller. We even allow people to keep the money on the platform and get a discount. When they do so, if you're a seller and you just sold something for a thousand dollars, keep it on Reverb. You get a one percent discount when you buy something else. We figured out how to sell shipping labels uh, and make some money on that. We sell insurance when you're shipping your item. Um, our average items are you know three hundred to five hundred dollars. So there's there's insurance capability. When did these other things start to come in? Like at what point could you take your focus from like just basic liquidity, getting buyers and sellers moving on the platform to Adding, like, what's, what's the advice you'd give for entrepreneurs on when is it premature yeah. and when is it time to go put the focus there? Yeah. Um, you know, there were other models. The, the other big um, revenue driver is what we call bump, and bump is how you promote your listing. So it's almost like Google AdWords within Reverb. It allows mm -hmm. people to give their listings more visibility, and we make another 100 to 200 basis points on that on average. We developed that around... 12 months into the platform. We developed direct checkout around 18 months into the platform. Well, maybe more like 14 months into the platform. And how far were you from a liquidity perspective? Like, where were you in that world in terms of, uh, so 12 months in, you are about 2 million to GMV. 12 months in, we were probably around three to 400,000 a month in GMV. Wow. And we started then. That's a lot of guitars, man. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we did 20 million last month. Wow. That's incredible. What? And especially at your price point. Yeah. I mean, what, what kind of unit count yeah. is that? Um, around 70,000 units um, wow. transacted. Yeah. Not just guitars, pedals, keyboards, right. DJ equipment, lighting. That's some serious liquidity. Yeah. You've got a lot happening. Yeah. That's exciting. <laughs> um, really exciting. Um, so, you know, you have a very interesting story, a lot of great things. The, um, you like the communist part, though, don't you? Oh, I think that's funny, you know. <laughs> I, you know, I, you don't hear a lot about communists these days, so I, I enjoyed it when you're like, you're not going to believe it, but I used to be a communist when we were preparing for this, and I'm like, you know, you don't hear that every day. Um, so it's, it, it, it makes it colorful. It's always fun, you know? Um, but, you know, really great insights. I want to take one more and then go to our audience questions, uh, which there's some really interesting ones. Um, you know, you've, you've talked a lot about how you got liquidity. You talked about how you built the fees. You've got some really interesting um, insights there, how to target the market. Um, but you, you've taken inspiration from Etsy. And in some ways, it might be obvious. In other ways, it's not obvious to people. A very different market. Talk a little bit about why Etsy gave you inspiration um, and how that manifests itself in your product. Yeah. You know, I think... Um and once again, the options express, I, I, I was really inspired by Charles Schwab and Ameritrade. Great products, just not servicing the niche that I, that I really wanted to, that we really needed to develop. Same thing with eBay. eBay was, is really good in the liquidity and they're really good at what they do, but if you're a musician, it's a very frustrating experience. When I saw Etsy, I was so inspired by the photography, the curation, the content, the merchandising that I felt that there was million, millions of artists and craftspeople from furniture makers to jewelry makers really had created this new opportunity for people. And I knew pe lots of people that loved buying and selling instruments that didn't have brick and mortar shops like Chicago Music Exchange. These, I, I met these customers, I meet them at guitar shows. I saw this similar demographic of these passionate micro entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And I felt that Reverb could fill that, that, that void of, of not having to go to a guitar show, just like artists aren't going, or jewelry makers aren't going to art fairs as much anymore. Etsy is some, a complementary way for them to actually run their business. I felt the same opportunity existed in, in, in our space. So I was very inspired by them. But inspired is what people don't think about what, what Etsy and Reverb is doing is creating merchandising. If you go to my store, Chicago Music Exchange, I guarantee you, you're not a musician, you'll be blown away. You walk into that store and your jaw will drop. I said, how the hell am I gonna do that online? How can I present inventory and make an online experience? Our average page views is like six or seven. 
Industry average for an e-commerce site is like two or three, right? So figuring out how to engage people online, I thought Etsy did a really good job of that, and that was kind of my, my mission and my inspiration. And how, and how would you as a technologist, as an entrepreneur, an innovator, um, who understands your market so well, what, how, how would you generalize the insights from Etsy that you, you applied in your own way with your own flavors and sauce in, uh, in Reverb and that we might all learn from mm -hmm. without stealing your secret sauce, of course? I, I think, I think you, have to, you have to extract great ideas from other businesses. I mean, I, I spend time on Airbnb site. I, I use the, the Uber app. Like to me, this is the synthesis of what we do as technologists isn't this like, you know, genie brainstorm idea. It is a synthesis of all these great platforms. There are people out there looking at Reverb today and being inspired by that and they're building some other, some other similar or complementary business. I think that's what's great about technology and that's why companies like Charles Schwab and eBay end up getting disrupted because they become legacy platforms. They become platforms that can't be nimble and can't move very quickly. My biggest challenge is how to keep my team, and I've got a team of 100 right now, around 40 in dev, is how to keep this platform relevant three years from now. I mean, I'm, right. I'm obsessing about that 40 today. in dev, wow. Yeah. Wow. How many employees do you have total? 100 at Reaver. Wow. That's incredible. That's incredible. Well, let me take some of the, let me get to the top audience questions here. Uh, what is one thing you wish you knew before you started your entrepreneurial career? <laughs> one thing I wish I knew. Um, Our number you know, one vote getter. You know, I'm still, this is the thing I'm still working on. And uh, I've got some, some team members here, is um, emotional intelligence. <laughs> um, I'm an extremely emotional per person. And a lot of people, when you work in an intense entrepreneurial environment, um, there's a lot of emotions and there's a lot of uh, real intensity. And not everyone's wired the same. And a lot of people take my style um, can take offense to my style or be, um, it makes them very uncomfortable. And I'm not super self-aware. And I think throughout my career, I've, I've, I've built a lot of bridges and a lot of good relationships. I've also burnt a lot of bridges because of my style and my technique. And as I get older as an entrepreneur, creating self-awareness and emotional intelligence, like really being aware of how you're perceived and how you work with others, like that, that to me is life. And that to me is like how you're going to build a great business and how you're going to surround yourself with talent. What do you think's helped you do that? Um, hiring good people that actually um, challenge me and, and being, staying curious, like keeping that curiosity there and wanting to actually um, have a feedback loop. Um, so if you're not curious and you have all the answers, you're not going to really grow as, a, as an individual or as an entrepreneur. Like, to me, um, I'm 49 years old. I've, I've been building companies for you know, 25 years, and I go to work with the same excitement today that I did when I started Client Base when I was 24. Because I'm surrounding myself with young, driven, motivated people, that's why 1871 is so popular. People want to be around people, positive people that have, that, that, that have vision and are optimistic. And to me, that's, that's really the key of our community. I think that's well put. So uh, must read books that have been influential or book that's been influential in your life? A book that's been influential in my life. That wouldn't be Karl Marx. <laughs> <laughs> Trotsky, it was Trotsky. Um, you caught me, you stumped me. It's like, it's not, you know, I'm not, I'm not a, um, uh, See, I can prepare you for my questions, but not for yeah. theirs. I mean, I read every book on Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. I'm like an autobiography and Jack Welch. I love like real autobiographies. So I was obsessing about Steve Jobs in 91, 92, 93, how he built uh, uh, Apple. And, and the, and Back the when he was days. a has-been. Yeah. And um, so I'm really into like business stories. I, I, I really obsess about that. Got it. Most valuable piece of advice you've ever received and how did it change you? Um, well, my partner, Ned, the one phrase that we, that we use over and over again is, and, and, I, and I, I, I swear by this, is a lot of littles equal a lot. And when you're building a company and you want to build a successful, a great company, it's, uh, it's the attention to details, it's the little things that the customers remember 
that build a great company. And a lot of littles equal a lot, and that's, that's worked for me in these, these last two businesses. Um, you talked a little bit about mentorship. People want to know, do you have a mentor, and how is, what kind of mentor, process, or experience have you had? You know, Ned is, um, is, is my biggest mentor in, um, in business and in life, and it's a lot of musicians. Um, last month, I had the greatest opportunity to spend time with Tom Petty uh, in my store. Oh, nice. Um, so this was kind of my, my childhood. Your life comes, yeah, right. And um, How cool. I was, I was very inspired by that. And so I find inspiration in music and my mentorship in business as um, are, you know, the greats. You know, the Steve Jobs is, is, is someone that I really admire and, and how he's taken risks and how he, he stood for, for excellence and, and, and building a great product. And uh, I'm a product-driven uh, entrepreneur. Like, I lead the product drives everything for me. Um, one last, and then we have our big uh, wrap-up questions here. So um, biggest challenge in getting Reverb launched? You know, for me, it was, it was I had a great network at Options Express. I had awesome programmers, and um, they were all in the .NET world, and we were like a Microsoft shop, and I knew I needed, I was going to do this in uh, Ruby on Rails. I was going to embrace open source and, and the Unix community. And I, I, did, I had nothing. I, I was reaching out to all my old network, and I was trying to like put my band back together, and it just it, it wasn't. Well, talk, talk about that, because one of the things I ask at the end, and we're getting here, the end here is, is uh, what is something you would n always do again, and what is something you would never do again? So why don't we start with never do again, because I think we're kind of yeah. moving in towards that. Well, trying to, you know, as you mature and you've worked with different people and you may have had different levels of success, um, trying to recreate that magic is, is often, often very, very hard. So the marketing, um, one of my closest friends who was active in our, in our marketing team at Options Express, um, I brought him along. He was going to come help at, at Chicago Music Exchange and, and early stages of Reverb. And it, wasn't, it, it was just a new chapter. It wasn't time um, for us to continue working together. So having to split up that, recognize that, that was a different opportunity, different relationship, time to move on. So I really um, would, um, um, new, t new business, new partnerships. Something you'd always do again, like, boy, I've learned my lesson, and when I start companies. It's, um, I, um, I'm a product guy, and if you're in the digital world and we're building technology thing, like the first hire, the technology, Actually, in, at Reverb, I hired a business guy who was an 1871er who was hanging out here. He loved the business. He loved it. And, I, and we had to part ways once again because I didn't have, he didn't have the engineering talent. He didn't have the technology to execute on the vision. So I had real vision. I can write like this much code. I really need like awesome um, technologists to surround myself. So, so how did you find hire, that right first tech hire for Reverb? So um, hire number one, um, Jan Pritzker, and he's not a Pritzker, but he's a Pritzker. <laughs> Only in Chicago you can say that. So um, Jan, uh, I posted on Craigslist, 2012. He was moving back from San Francisco, musician, um, loved the idea, came by the store, Reverb was just an idea, and uh, we hit it off, and uh, Jan was the, the, the sort of seed that helped. And what made him the right that right hire for that first hire? I could just see it in his eyes. I could see his passion and his, his drive for building great technology and, 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 and having vision. And then I, I hired an, another technology guy, second hire, uh, Dan Melnick, who's our chief operating officer. Same drive, determination, loves building businesses, totally embracing technology with a vision, right? So these guys are, are, are the core to our team. And, um, and then that, was what allows you to attract great talent around that. Um, last question we always ask, you were a founder in Chicago in the early 90s, in the late 90s and early 2000s, um, now again in the 2010s. Um, what's your view on Chicago for entrepreneurship and starting digital companies today? What do you, are we in a good position, an okay position? Like how do you, how do you see the environment and, and the potential and what the out, that means for the outlook in the coming yeah. years? You know, as a Midwesterner, I'm, I'm a firm believer. I remember in, um, when we were, we were taking Options Express public, I got asked that question a lot. And it was an easier answer then because we were in finance. You had the exchanges here. 
and it was kind of like we were taking old exchange and banking and financing jobs and we were building a technology company. So there was a lot of talent that understood finance, understood that, and were able to embrace that. So it was a little easier to answer then. I think today, um, what makes Chicago great? Well, I, uh, Reverb's located up on the north side, so I'm not in River North. I'm not, I'm not sort of in the hustle bustle intentionally. I, I like the idea that you don't necessarily have to be like around a lot of other tech companies to, um, to prosper. Just like I don't believe you need to be in the Bay Area to build a great tech company. What you need is a, is a good eth work ethic, which we have in the Midwest. People actually work here. You have loyalty. You have a real loyalty. You have a culture of get shit done. This town gets shit done like no other town um, in terms of, yeah, it's a lot of politics that, 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 it, that encapsulates that. But that ethic of actually wanting to build stuff I think is very unique to Chicago. And I think we don't give ourselves enough credit like that. Developing Ruby on Rails skills or being a, a JavaScript or a Go developer, like those are things that can be learned or taught. I've imported half of our staff, like we've imported from, from surrounding Midwest um, area and even people from the Bay Area moving back here. So if you have a vision and you have good foundation, which Chicago is great for, you can build a great company here. I have no doubt we can build significant large companies and it's a livable city people want to live here people want to raise their families here but well, you're uh, you're building a great another great company here so thank you for that and thank you for tonight it's been fantastic thank you David. for all thank you me. do awesome thank you